Welcome to the program, guys. I wanted to jump right into uh, some of the basics of this real quick for this first hour, uh, just to kind of familiarize everybody with this particular story. Um, who would like to go first, actually? Okay. Well, uh, this is a very fascinating case that we're we're talking about the collision of a of an unidentified flying object with a small plane. It happened right along the Texas Mexico border in August of 1974, and uh, it's a case that hasn't been uh, there hasn't been that much research done on it yet. Ruben and I have been uh, endeavoring to. Uh, interview people in the, in the area where this happened and talk to other UFO investigators who have heard bits and pieces about it. We were first pointed in the direction of what happened here by the research that was conducted by one of the pioneer UFO investigators, Leonard Stringfield. Mm-hmm. We were looking through some of his materials. So what we'd like to do uh, tonight, Jack, is we'd like to carefully analyze uh, step-by-step on a timeline uh, basis, we'd like to look at how the event unfolded, basically uh, moment by moment, and then as we go along, we can add comment and information about what we found out since we wrote the book. Additional information has come to light okay. about the event of that evening. Sounds good to me. Now, I, uh, you know, you uh, outlined actually a really nice timeline. Um, uh, documents for me actually to have in front of me and I got a chance you know you had sent me the book and I got a chance to read the book and uh, you know the last two shows that we did we didn't even really get a chance to uh, hit on some of the facets of it so I really like how you have things outlined tonight because I really think it's going to give a lot of people a very good view of some of this stuff and with the fact that they can finish after the show, they can actually tune into the History Channel and see it on the UFO Hunters, I think is a, is a great combination. Absolutely. That's, uh, we're really, uh, our, uh, we were just at awe with the fact that we're, here we are on national radio with you, and then at the same time, uh, our whole story is being shown on the History Channel and the UFO Hunters tonight. Exactly, so, exactly. Pretty awesome. <laughs> that was the other point about February the 20th was, to have, aside from the lunar eclipse there, Captain, the fact that we're, we're having this opportunity to be with you. All different. the audience. All kinds of things going on tonight, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, why don't we start off with this, uh, let's, let's jump into uh, August 25th, 1974, which was a Sunday. Well, I think everyone is pretty well familiar with the uh, Roswell, New Mexico UFO crash of 1947. Right. And uh, that has been the most famous UFO crash and retrieval case in, in the history of this field. And um, that was something that occurred in the 40s. And there had been, you know, there have been some other reported UFO incidents involving crashes over the years. But... Then suddenly, you know, there, for a long time, the field, the area of crashes, crashed UFO stories had been kind of dormant. And then suddenly, we have this one, which is uh, really in its infancy in terms of being uh, looked at and being carefully investigated, and we're, we're hoping to bring more to light on that. But on Sunday, uh, August 25th, 1974, there was basically the story begins with uh, the detection of an inbound object off the Texas Gulf Coast in the area of Corpus Christi, Texas. Corpus Christi is on the e- in the eastern part of Texas along the Gulf Coast, and it's one of the state's most important seaport cities. And so um, at about 10.07 p.m. Uh, Texas time, uh, there was this object that just suddenly appeared on radar, military radar screens there in the Corpus Christi area, and it was flying in very fast. It had, uh, it, since it seemed to appear out of nowhere, it was obviously uh, the uh, thinking there was that it had dropped down out of the Earth's atmosphere. It was flying very fast at a very high altitude, and uh, so the mystery began with the initial radar sightings by military stations all along the eastern part of the state of Texas. And the, the, I just want to throw this in there real quick. Their first thought was was that it could possibly be a missile because of its speed until they saw it like changing directions, wasn't it? 1974 uh, was the 
period of time when we were still involved in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Uh, we were uh, stockpiling uh, nuclear weapons, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, were a threat. And so definitely, it's, it's, as you point out, there was the initial fear that uh, because of the fact that Houston, uh, which lies just to the north of Corpus and Corpus itself are important um, bay or port areas of, of the state, that maybe this was an inbound ICBM that was targeted to one or both of those cities mm. and uh, could, could indicate the initial wave of an attack against the United States. And, uh, but in, in what was really strange were the characteristics of this. The object, uh, first appeared at, uh, as I said, 2,500 miles per hour. And, uh, there was such a high degree of alert, uh, that, that the U.S. Air, Air Force was suddenly thrown into, uh, the defense, uh, a defense alert was called. And there were actually preparations made to go out uh, to send uh, fighter jets out to look over the, this incoming object. Uh, so, so the level of alert and the level of fear was very high at this initial initial contact point, just a little after 10 p.m. on on August 25, 1974. Right. And uh, Ruben, uh, Ruben, do you want to pick up the story at that point? What happened next yeah. as the uh, as the UFO made a slow turn to the to the south and headed down toward Brownsville? Yes, uh, <clears throat> actually, as this uh, object was uh, starting to go into uh, U.S. airspace, and it started to go in steps, so uh, right away, the, I mean, that was not your typical meteor, which goes into an, the, uh, like a curve or elliptical. It goes. This is slowly just going step by step. Then at around approximately around 10:10, uh, 10, 10, it uh, start. It moves. Uh, south, south toward Brownsville, about 40 miles out, and then it enters into the Mexican airspace. Right. And it's, uh, so as it's traveling, it's descending in speed around approximately 1900, uh, 1,955 miles per hour. And, uh, as it's dropping near, uh, as it's flying, it's flying over this, uh, over the northern part of Mexico. Um, and appro approximately around, Oh, 1025, um, it's, it's, uh, run, it's, tra it's traveling about 500 miles inward over, uh, over the state of Chihuahua, where there at approximately, um, um, let's see here, there was another airplane, a small airplane that left out of El Paso uh, International Airport around 9.30. Ruben, I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about what has happened since the UFO turned into Mexican airspace and then yeah, went across northern Mexico. Uh, yeah. There are some key uh, points that we'd like to cover okay. there. Um, what when when the initial sighting was made, uh, the the object was uh, about 200 miles east of Corpus Christi, out over the Gulf of Mexico. So it was just out over open water, and it was headed inbound toward Corpus. And then it made that that kind of a veering motion to the south, and at that point it seemed to be headed toward Brownsville, which is is another Texas coastal city that, uh, you know, at that point could have been viewed as a potential target for an in incoming missile. Mm -hmm. Now, as it headed down toward Brownsville, it was still out over the uh, waters of the Gulf of Mexico, and it went to a point about 40 miles south of Brownsville, and then it made this sudden and pronounced 90-degree turn into northern Mexico. Now, 40 miles south of Brownsville, Texas, is, is a part of Mexico that is completely desolate. There is hardly, there's virtually no population there. And as Ruben and I tracked uh, the course of this object over northern Mexico, headed up toward Chihuahua State, we, w the unique thing about the flight path of this object, as it continued to be tracked by radar along the Texas-Mexico border, there are several military stations all along the, uh, the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, at, we noticed that the unique characteristic about the flight path of this object is that it's 
it stayed over very remote and sparsely populated areas of mm-hmm. northern Mexico. It avoided the larger cities. For instance, it, it avoided uh, Matamoros. Uh, it went in south of Matamoros, which is the sister city to Brownsville. It avoided uh, Monterrey, one of the largest cities in Mexico, and it, it skirted the north, northeastern quadrant of Monterrey, well, well clear of the city. And then it, it proceeded in, on into the very sparsely populated Mexican state of Chihuahua, which is mo- mainly consists of the Chihuahuan Desert, a uh, lot of mountainous, rugged terrain, isolated areas that with that uh, that have very little population. So that's what the unique we found was a very unique characteristic of the trajectory of this huh. down unidentified. And, and all the while, it also stayed out of. U.S. airspace as well. Didn't it just kind of skim the borders? That's the puzzling thing about it. You know, there was such a high level of concern by U.S. military, and there were aircraft that were about to be scrambled to intercept, and then suddenly this object seemed to make it clear, make its intentions clear that it was going to stay away from U.S. airspace. Huh. It kind of darted on down south and then into Mexican airspace, and our research has indicated that uh, Mexico still had a very developing uh, military situation in the early 70s, and yeah. it's, the capabilities of its air force at that point were not extremely, um, nowhere near what the U.S. has even today. You know, there were very few aircraft available in its arsenal, and there was very little surveillance going on of what was going on over Mexican airspace at that time. Right. So basically, this object, as long as it stayed in over Mexican airspace, it was pretty much in the clear. So basically, uh, whatever this this object was, it was not going to uh, come into hostile airspace if it was in the United States. Right, right. So it definitely knew what it was doing. So here's this object, just to, just to clarify in everyone's mind, here's this object moving at extremely high speeds, anywhere from 25... 2,500 miles an hour to 1,900 miles an hour, avoiding towns, staying in desolate areas, staying out of the United States airspace, and all the while being tracked by several U.S. and Mexican radar stations. We don't, we don't know at which point the Mexicans picked it up, but it was certainly being tracked by uh, military stations which existed at... at uh, Del Rio, Texas, and uh, Laredo, Texas, and all along the border between Texas and Mexico. So it was it was lighting up all these radars along the right along the Rio Grande River, right. and uh, the decision was made to scramble some jets to intercept, but they never got off the ground. Uh, they didn't get off the ground before it was determined that the radar blip had disappeared off the screen. And that's where the story that, that, uh, this kicks into the second phase of the story. And that is, and what, what we can do is we can take, uh, we can take the story of the, the uh, small airplane that took off from El Paso at 9.30 p.m., uh, which was about half an hour before the uh, UFO was spotted off the Gulf of Mexico. We had a uh, this small airplane take off from El Paso International Airport, which is um, in West Texas, uh, right near the border with New Mexico. And uh, so it took off from uh, the small plane. We don't, the occupants are unknown. The small plane took off headed for Mexico City. So it was on a trajectory that would bring it eventually bring it directly into the trajectory of the inbound UFO. Right. So that's that's the next phase of the story that we enter okay. into. So basically, as it was heading uh, south toward Mexico City, unknown uh, to the pilot, and uh, the plane's flight path puts it right on the intercept course with the streaking UFO, as Noe had indicated. So sometime around uh, 1025, Captain, um, it, uh, basically there was a collision between both the small plane and the object. And it uh, crashed over in the, over a sparse area close to the small little town of Koyame, which, uh, like, no is very familiar with that whole area there as we were doing this research because uh, it's very close to the border of Texas by Presidio 
Um, but that area there is it's approximately around uh, population population of 2,000 people. Mm-hmm. The uh, crash now occurred at least about 50, mi- 50 miles from the town center. <clears throat> And that's so two thousand. Very... That's two thousand people in the entire state. We should clarify, <laughs> in the entire state of. Uh, I'm sorry, into in the entire municipality, what they call, which is like a county, what we would call a county. It's a very large area. Um, geographically, it's a very large area. Right. So these two thousand inhabitants are spread out over many small ranches, with maybe five to ten people living at each ranch. Okay. The the only uh, population center of any size is the small town of Koyama, which has a resident which has a population of 611 residents. So we're talking about a very remote location. And the other thing, Ruben, that's very interesting. People have asked Ruben and me. Uh, you say that the UFO initially appeared at 75,000 feet altitude, right. and then it eventually crashed with a small plane coming out of El Paso, how does that, I mean, because small planes obviously would not be flying at that altitude. Right. But so it, the it answer, altitude, the, didn't it? Yeah. The answer was that there was a continuous, gradual um, dropping down and slowing down of the UFO as it went across northern Mexico, so that by the time it came to the area of Coyama, Mexico, it had already dropped down significantly, uh, and um, what it seemed to be headed headed down to the ground at that point. It, it had come down very far in elevation. It had traveled 500 miles from where it first entered Mexican airspace, and its speed was down under 2,000 miles an hour, and uh, it was down somewhere between 3,000 and 7,000 feet an altitude, which would be an altitude that the small plane would be at in order to avoid the, the tall mountains right. uh, that are all around that northern Chihuahua area. You know, Noe, uh, what's a, a thought that just occurred to me, and I know we talked briefly about it, but had this uh, object kept its tra- trajectory, one of the big, biggest major military installations would have been uh, Fort Bliss, uh, right there in El Paso, Texas, which which will talk about it further in our story there, Captain, where about Fort Bliss, but it's an interesting as uh, this object is uh, avoiding large uh, cities and avoiding uh, the track and it's descending down and it, uh, beyond it as you're going closer, closer again toward the U.S. border, we're running into other major U.S. installations. Now, here's, a, here's another very intriguing question that Ruben and I have been wrestling with over the past few months that uh, following our conference, we spoke at the uh, at the um, UFO Crash Retrieval Conference in Las Vegas a few months ago. Uh, that was back in November. And uh, we during that, we had a question at Q&A session after our presentation, and then several, we talked to several other researchers. And the question came up uh, in our minds from talking to some of these other folks and listening to the questions they had. The question came up: um, What, where might this unidentified flying object have been headed? Yes. In other words, where would the, if you map out the trajectory that where it was coming from, where might it have been headed? And and that actually, when we looked, when we plotted it all out on maps, that becomes an extremely intriguing question. Right. Yeah, that's one of the questions that I, I was thinking of, is if it had not collided with this aircraft, where would it have wound up with the obvious pattern? With It, it appears to us from just looking, just kind of eyeballing uh, the trajectory that it had been on and where it might have been headed, it appears to us that one could easily argue that uh, it might have been headed toward Nevada, right. uh, Utah, or even New Mexico, Arizona area, somewhere in the southwest, and on up to, uh, you know, the Nevada area, which, uh, you know, that introduces a, a whole other layer of complexity because uh, we have, you know, for many years it has been suspected that perhaps there uh, are captured UFOs that have been held 
and tested out of a facility in, in uh, Nevada that is commonly referred to as Area 51. So um, it seems from analyzing the trajectory that that would have been within the realm of where this object may have been headed toward. Right. Huh. It's a very interesting very scenario. Interesting. All right, let me, uh, let me just stop you right there because uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour here, so we've got to take a uh, quick break for uh, station IDs and things of that nature. It's very, very interesting how it's outlined, though, and uh, very, very important to see in that the way that it was, the speed that it was going, the way that it was dropping altitude, the, the course that it was taking, it obviously says that it rules out many things such as meteorite and missile, and uh, definitely under some sort of intelligent control, to say the least. So, let's see here. All right. All right, we're going to take a quick break here, so uh, stay right where you are. This is Paranormal Radio. I'm your host, Captain Jack, and uh, we'll uh, be returning shortly to continue on with this uh, very, very interesting story. And uh, so stay right where you are. Don't go away. We'll... Uh, We'll be right back. We've got some really interesting uh, audio clips for you as well. So uh, stay right there. We'll be right back. Cuyame, Mexico. A small town not found on many maps. A place swallowed up by the Mexican desert. Home to more agave plants than people. Coyame is situated in the northern part of the estate of Chihuahua, and our municipality is 7,000 square feet. We have between 2,000 and 2,500 people. It's a calm place, a beautiful place. A place with no library, no archives, and no local historian. But that doesn't mean it's a town without a history. Here, history is passed from neighbor to neighbor. And it's this oral history that gives testimony to an unsolved air collision that took place here just three decades ago. It began as a civilian plane took off from El Paso, Texas, en route to Mexico City. August 25th, 1974. It was a plane that was coming out from El Paso. It was going to Mexico City. And it was an accident. They say that there was a crash between a plane and a UFO within the territories of the municipality. I don't think this could be made up. How could someone make this up? It's true. You are listening to... Paranormal Radio on 99.7 in Chicago and 104.1 in St. Louis. And now, once again, your host, the voice of darkness, Captain Jack. Indeed, that's me. Welcome back to Paranormal Radio. Boy, we're all, uh, we're all of us are, seems like we're all banged up. You, your back, and me being sick. What the heck's going on here? <laughs> So what? What? Yep. They, they, what did the chiropractor just pound on you a little bit today, or what's the deal? Oh yeah, I've been trying to get myself. Uh, I've been out of alignment for the last week, and then uh, finally had to go to the chiropractor, and it was relief. But I have to tell you, it was pretty painful trying to get get that the neck cracked and get that back in shape there. But uh, right. I told Noe that I said. I hope I I hope I don't uh, fade out too much here. But <laughs> I think he's the healthy one out of the bunch there. Yeah, he's 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 the one that's gonna have to carry us both. We'll both uh, <laughs> both fade out. All right, all right. Welcome back, you guys. Uh, all right, so we've outlined exactly the trajectory of this thing. That was, you know, let's let's. I really I'd really like to know what you found as far as it's. If it would have stayed on course, where would it have gone? What, what, where would it have headed? Well, it was definitely headed to the southwestern United States. Uh, how far north uh, or northwest from from there it would have gone? Of course, it's just it's all speculation. But uh, we we're thinking that uh, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, uh, Arizona area would be within the range. Uh, given some minor 
changes to the trajectory could have gone in any of those directions. Right. And and then on up to the northwest from there. Hmm. So it becomes intriguing because of the the fact that there have been so many case uh, UFO cases linked to Area 51 right. in Nevada. Right. Um, hmm. You know, the suggestion is that um, over the years, perhaps we've been trying to kind of reverse engineer, back engineer some of the technology from uh, UFOs, either right. the that have been observed or that may have even come into our possession. Yeah. That we have either attempted to fly those actual spacecraft or uh, flown our uh, air, uh, aircraft of our own design that are patterned after uh, the UFO technology. So, uh, you know, that's another intriguing possibility. Sure. One of the one of the questions that uh, has been brought up uh, the last couple of times we had you on was, if this thing collided with a, a, an aircraft, there should be some sort of report of like missing of a missing plane or or you know family members saying, hey, you know, he took off from here, he never showed up, they lost radar of him. I mean, that's one of the things that came up about this. But you looked into all of that, right? But we. Ha- we and other UFO investigators, including uh, Leonard Stringfield and Elaine Douglas and others that have looked into this case, we've never been able to find anything with regard to the the occupants of the small plane flying out of uh, El Paso. Those records uh, apparently do, do not exist or have been expunged, and a lot of times our records don't aren't kept for that long. For instance, we... We sent off uh, looking for radar records from the time period from 1974 of any anomalous sightings along the uh, Texas-Mexico border. Right. And we were told, uh, we got several very official-looking letters back from the Air Force and other agencies of the U.S. government that indicated, that told us that they don't keep those records for that far back. Sure. I think they keep them for 10 years. Uh, and so whatever records may have existed, they're either been taken away or the other possibility is that this plane was of Med- Mexican registry. Uh, it may have landed at El Paso just briefly or temporarily. And, in, in, uh, you know, it may have been headed like from the west coast of, of Mexico on up to El Paso and then down to Mexico City. We don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the people in Mexico tell us that it might have been, it might have even been uh, a, a drug smuggling airplane, mm. which wanted to uh, remain as undetected as possible as it made its flight back from Texas, possibly carrying a load of something it shouldn't be carrying right. or back or, back into Mexico. Right. Or, uh, uh, and, uh-huh. Or had just dropped off and was heading. Or back. had just dropped off, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, this was the '70s. Uh, not to. It was a period of time when there was a lot of illegal activity going along in the Texas-Mexico border, which was one of the reasons that the U.S. Border Patrol set up the largest uh, electronic surveillance operation it has in the United States, right there at El Paso, right at the at the uh, Fort Bliss compound. Right. So uh, there is some thought on the part of the Mexican UFO investigators we've talked to that the small plane might have been involved in something that they certainly didn't want to create a, a very high profile, um, you know, impact with a lot of documentation and stuff like that. They might have been trying to quietly sneak along the border sure. back down toward Mexico City. And that makes a with- lot of sense, actually, in this case. And the interesting yes. case is that several uh, other airplanes have gone down in the Koyama area, well, not necessarily in Koyama, but in Chihuahua State, that have been related to drug smuggling, uh, failed drug smuggling attempts. Uh-huh. And uh, so this is not an uncommon scenario for that area. Yeah. Right, right. I, I don't want to take, take away from, from, from our point here, but, you know, the, the movie uh, Captain the... Uh, no Country for Old Men. Right. That was filmed right there in that uh, Don't Reveal, the Southwest area, although the focus was, again, on the drug cartels on both sides. Uh-huh. But kind of gives you an idea. I don't know if you haven't seen the movie. It's a great movie. But 
it really you pick that period of time uh, up to now the, of the problems with uh, with that. If if uh, that's one of the, of course that's something that's one of the theories that we need to look at. If it's whether or not the plane, what what what, what was its uh, final destination? Right, right. We do know that the plane was registered in Mexico and it was headed back to its home base, which was Mex- Mexico City. Um, Mexico City being the largest populated area in Mexico, uh, it would have been easy for somebody to fake records, to, you know, doctor records, and if they were involved in illegal activity. Uh, because of the complications, uh, because of the time that has elapsed since this occurred and because of the fact that no pilot or occupants were ever identified. It's going to be difficult at this point to try to go back and locate anything additional from that perspective. Sure. But uh, we have verified with a number of pilots who have flown that route uh, from El Paso to Mexico City that this would be a just a normal traditional route that would take. Uh, planes over the Koyama area, so this wasn't necessarily something that was where the flight path was way out of the way. It was a normal flight path, and it just so happens that that particular evening, uh, there was another object in the sky that was not supposed to be there and that was moving extremely fast, and uh, before the, apparently, before the uh, pilot of the small plane could react or do anything about it, uh, the two aircraft collided. Right. The uh, the small plane was almost completely obliterated. When the Mexican soldiers showed up at the scene later, they described it as being almost totally gone. There were just small pieces I mean. left. And that there was no the mention. Day. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, that leads us into day two, right, now. Yes. Uh, All right, we're, we're almost day two. there. Uh-huh. Well, I do want to cover a few points about what happened immediately after the crash because it was like nine or ten hours between the time that the crash occurred and the first people arrived at the scene. Right. And it's very, very interesting because people have uh, people have asked us, why was there no effort made immediately? Why was it nine or ten hours from the time that the crash happened there in the Chihuahuan Desert until the time that somebody actually ventured out there. Right. It, one, you know, that was a question that lingered in Ruben and, and my my mind until such time as we actually went out there and saw where this is located. Uh, when when night comes in the Koyame, in Koyame, there's no artificial lighting for miles there. It is as, just about as dark as, as any place can get. We're like uh, on another like on another planet, uh, that landscape, the desert landscape, it's so vast. There's huge mountain ranges all around there. It's totally dark at night. There are no paved roads or street lighting of any kind. Right. Other other than the small Mexican Federal Highway that runs from uh, from the uh, Texas border on through to the capital of Chihuahua State, which is the city of Chihuahua. It's a small uh, highway, mainly two lane, that goes uh, through Koyama. Sure. But uh, I mean, when once you get out in the desert where this event happened, it is pitch black. Nobody, hardly anybody, lives there, and it would have been impossible for anybody to react in the in the nighttime to this event. Huh. Yeah. Assume. And this is 1974, so we're even looking at the uh, the limitations of the uh, Mexican officials at that particular time to be able to scramble anything to to a remote area like that within a, a sufficient amount of time. It's just right. it's inconceivable to say that they could actually have even pulled it off within a, a matter of a couple of hours. So the the timeline makes sense of actually getting out to such a rural area. They were going to have to do the search by plane. And so you've got these huge mountain ranges in the dark right. with no kind of artificial illumination. I mean, that you would have had a couple more planes going down oh, if, they, yeah. if they had tried to do a search at night. Most definitely. So they waited until the following morning. Um, now, that, here's an interesting component to this. Now, we talked to some of the ranch owners and people who work out in the ranches where this happened. 
And we ran across an elderly gentleman named Pedro Venegas who who uh, worked, lived and worked at a ranch out where this would have had to have occurred based on the trajectory of the two aircraft as we've determined. Mm -hmm. uh, and he told us that on he remembers a night in 1974, he's certain about the year, he's not certain about the time of year or the month, but he says that he heard a series of very extremely loud explosions that occurred one night in 1974. He was uh, uh, a, a young person, of course, a lot younger at that time. He's in his 80s now. And uh, he, uh, the explosions were so loud that they, sh they rattled the windows of, of the small farm ranch house out there near the location, and he was fearful that there would be damage to the structure of, the, of that ranch house uh -huh. because of the intensity of the explosions. Now, that was a kind of an eerie interview we had, a, we had it with him out there in that very desolate ranch where he lives. Right. And while we were talking about the Koyama case uh, and the fact that he heard this in 1974, then he started pulling out these notebooks. He said, wait just a minute, I'll show you. Yeah. He started pulling out these notebooks in which he has written other UFO sightings that he, have ha he has had over the years uh -huh. right there at that same ranch. Huh. Uh, and we were really surprised, Captain, that he really had that notebook there and he had diagrams and that, and he started to show it to uh, show them to Noe and, and, and to me and... Uh, uh, we got some good, good little pictures of, of his diagrams, but that that was was amazing. He was, uh, you know, in that remote area there, whenever anything flies that's out of the ordinary, he would start documenting it. Right, right. But he never, he never put the the, the uh, connection between the explosion that he heard in 1974 to it actually being anything to do with a UFO of any kind until you came and, and talked to him about anything that he remembered about that time period. Correct. As we told him about what we had heard about the Koyami case, after we asked him questions and then he wanted to know what it was all about, we started telling him the story as we know it, and there was this kind of a glimmer of sudden realization that came over his face, like, you know, this what you're telling me could very well have been that very incident. Uh, huh. You know, there was a sudden dawning of realization that came across him. Sure, sure. And, and what was very interesting also to us was the fact that that incident in 1974 that he remembers seems to have been what sparked his interest in UFOs and caused him to keep these volumes of notebooks that he has kept over the years. Uh, on other things that he's seen in the night sky, and, and I mean, he, he, uh, we we looked at those notebooks, and he he would put the coloration of the objects he saw, uh -huh. the direction that they were traveling. He would write down the approximate speed. Uh, he would he would draw diagrams of the of the surrounding mountain mountains to indicate from what direction to what direction. It was, he was very detailed. Huh. And some of those sightings that have occurred in, in recent years, uh, in the last yeah. couple of years. So uh, what we conclude from that is that this is still an area that is a, extremely active with UFO sightings. Right, and, right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. as we started doing our research here, uh, Captain, and as we started interviewing witnesses, we were just amazed with the amount of stories of uh, <clears throat> sightings that have been occurring in that whole area. Sure. I'd imagine. Very interesting. So here we go. We have we have the the crash. We have uh, uh, sunrise comes and uh, they set out and and the first people show up on on site at the uh, the crash scene. Uh, what do they find other than the the plane being completely obliterated? It's not the only thing they found, did they? Well, here here's day two. Now uh, it has been about nine or ten hours since the crash occurred and it's sunrise now on Monday, August 26, 1974 because of the remoteness of the area and the darkness and all those factors we talked about nobody's gone out there overnight so the wreckage has just been kind of smoldering out there in the desert there's almost nothing left of the civilian plane 
the disc is fairly well intact, which we'll talk about later. But uh, so it's it's sunrise on on the 26th, and at some point, maybe before sunrise or shortly thereafter, a um, we estimate that between 12 and 24. Um, well, actually, let me back up. First, there was an airplane that was uh, a spotter airplane that was dispatched out of Chihuahua City, uh, which is the site of the nearest uh, Mexican Air Force uh, air base. And so they dispatched the spotter plane out uh, sometime after sunrise on the 26th. And so, and, and around that same time, it seems to me, uh, probably concurrent with the uh, taking off of the spotter plane, uh, there was a a group of soldiers that was sent out from the Army base, probably in Okinaga, which is about 30 miles away from the crash site, right along the border with Texas, uh, is the, uh, the nearest Army base uh, there in Okinaga, Mexico. So they sent out uh, the soldiers. Uh, to go along with the, uh, to also do the ground search while the spotter plane did the, the air search. And so at about 10.35 in the morning, that the spotter plane r- arrives on the scene and it finds what looks like small debris from the crash of a, of a civilian airplane, of the small airplane. And, but, uh, no more than a couple of minutes later then, suddenly the, uh, the radio traffic uh, that the Mexicans are uh, carrying out during this rescue mission, which is, by the way, is being monitored by the electronic surveillance network along the Texas-Mexico border, which is very sophisticated. As we were talking about earlier, this is a, an area that has been of concern because of drug trafficking and so right. forth. And one of, the, one of the largest electronic monitoring networks is uh, ranges from El Paso on south along the Texas-Mexico border. So... This is being picked up, the radio traffic, and there was a couple of minutes after the wreckage of the small plane was found, then the spotter plane finds a second wreckage site, and uh, so therein is the first mention of this silvery, dish-shaped object that was impacted there into the desert, uh, just a short distance away from the from where the wreckage of the small plane was. Right. And uh, so that's where the the story begins to get extremely interesting, <laughs> to say the least, to say the least. And and this this you get the the aircraft that it collided with. There's hardly anything left of it. The damage to the disc was fairly minimal. Yeah, there must have been some really incredibly tough material there because there were two yeah. minor damage points. Yeah, when Captain the uh, when the Mexican soldiers arrived at the scene uh, a while later, um, they of course uh, there wasn't much to p- to pick up from the wreck of the small plane. It appears that they visited the wreck of the small plane first, uh, but when they got to the second part, it really it really got uh, interesting. After that, the Mexican soldiers uh, came out of their vehicles and stood before this object. It was a traditional silver disc-shaped UFO, what might be called a Saturn-shaped UFO, with the uh, the dome on top, a uh, small dome on the bottom, and the uh, circular um, outer rim right. in the middle, convex at the top and bottom, it was a small object, as many UFOs that have been spotted over the years have been. Uh, have been. This one was approximately 16 feet 5 inches in diameter and about 5 feet high. Uh, the soldiers walked around this object trying to determine what it might be. Could it be a U.S. experimental missile? Could it be an experimental aircraft that had straight in from the U.S. side, as, as a lot of military hardware historically over the years has strayed into Mexico right. from test firings in, in the, on the U.S. side. But they found that there were no doors, windows, ports, or vents 
on this disc. There was no For kind of propulsion. There was no kind of propulsion system that they could see. Yeah. And this was obviously not a a rocket or missile of, or traditional aircraft or missile of any of any kind. Huh. That's it, it, and it, it just had a slight damage on it, right? Just uh, on, on one side. There were two small damage points. Uh, one on each side of the of the uh, craft. One was uh, basically a dent where it had been dented inward, and the other one was a small puncture hole on the other end of the main section of the aircraft. Now, we can just imagine, we can pull ourselves back for a moment and imagine these soldiers um, standing out there in the, in the blazing hot, autumn day in the middle of this Chihuahuan desert in complete isolation, mountain ranges ranges all around them. Mm-hmm. And all they, they've got in front of them this unexplained object which they can find no rhyme and reason for. <laughs> you know, you can imagine what thoughts might have been racing through their mind oh, yeah. as they examined it, probably touched it. But the tragic thing about it is that they were totally unprepared to handle a, an incident of this magnitude. And we've spoken to folks who have been Im- involved in the recovery of uh, objects that have fallen back to Earth from outer space over the years. Uh, among them, one of our consultants for this book was Sergeant Clifford Stone, who was involved in between 10 and 12 UFO crash retrieval operations for the U.S. military. And the, he was he pointed out to us that the Mexicans were obviously ill equipped, both equipment wise and hardware wise, and they didn't have suits, they didn't have the proper equipment to deal with an incident of this magnitude involving this, these unknown materials and unknown propulsion systems. Right. So the tragic part of this is that while these Mexican soldiers were touching and surveilling this this crashed ship, they became exposed to something that was invisible. You know, it was obviously taste, it was obviously uh, uh, could not be smelled, could not be seen. Right. And yet some something that maybe had to do with the propulsion system of this aircraft or radiation emanating from this spacecraft was infiltrating them at a cellular level and was starting was causing a, starting to cause a chain reaction of events which basically later resulted within 30 minutes to an hour resulted in the deaths of every single member of those of that Mexican uh, recovery team uh, <laughs> and throughout this period uh uh, Captain, they are being monitored by satellites. So they're in, being under heavy surveillance of uh, reconnaissance aircraft and, the, the, and satellites as uh, as this uh, Mexican team was there to recover the airplane. And knowing, like Noe had mentioned, they came across an air an airplane. I mean, uh, the object. Right. So they weren't expecting that. They weren't equipped uh, again. Uh, and then they come across from a technology from beyond beyond our stars. And, and here's, two, two, here's two very important parts to that, is that when the recovery effort began, the United States military offers assistance, which was denied, for one. Two, the, milita- the United States military was watching this entire thing with the, uh, with like the keyhole KH-9 satellites surveilling it. Uh, it's, it's as if though they kind of knew... These guys are biting off more than they can chew. The involvement of the or the actions of the U.S. military are very interesting with regard to this entire case because the object was closely monitored by radar and uh, the uh, intelligence assets that we had at our disposal along the border were obviously brought right right to bear on this situation right away and they stayed with it the whole time so apparently this was an event that was of extreme interest and in talking to Clifford Stone and others who have done a lot of research and have even been involved themselves in crash retrieval operations um, basically this was carried out 
by the book. It was a by the book crash retrieval operation. The surveillance assets were, were put into place. A military team was brought in from uh, several areas of from different areas of the United States. They were assembled at Fort Bliss because of its proximity to the crash site. Mm -hmm. And all of this was happening behind the scenes, even as the Mexican team was, you know, starting to load all the debris onto their trucks, intending to take it back to their base at, at Ojinaga. Uh, as all of this was going on, there were preparations being made across the, the border in Texas. Uh, people were being flown in from various parts around the country, people who are ready to go at a moment's notice whenever an event like this occurs. Um, Sergeant uh, Stone himself was involved in these sorts of operations and gave us a lot of insight into who would be brought in. There would be a number of teams. There would be a team that would go immediately to assess the situation and stand by close to where the crash had occurred. There would be uh, safe houses that would be prepared where the material would be taken after it was retrieved. There would be uh, all the equipment, the suits, the... Um, uh, chemical, uh, biological, uh, and nuclear uh, protection uh, suits would be brought into play. Uh, and uh, there would also be some assets brought in to clear the, uh, the, the, the uh, crash side of any evidence that others might later go and try to collect. Right. So all of these things were being brought slowly into play, uh, even as the Mexican team was wrapping up its its own retrieval effort, and they actually got all the material onto the trucks and were headed back to their base when <clears throat> whatever they were exposed to, and we, we don't know based on the documentation we have whether it might have been chemical, biological. Um, Clifford Stone doesn't think it, it's nuclear because uh, the radiation that typically occurs at crashes like this is not conventional radiation nuclear radiation right. such as occurs with nuclear weapons but it's a, it's on a different magnitude or on a diff different scale but it could have been some form of radiation that we're unaccustomed to so um, you know uh, this was starting to have its effect and and at the same time the US was continuing to monitor the progress of the Mexican team they were uh, they actually sent an aircraft to overfly the Mexican convoy of trucks as they headed back to their base. Uh, these uh, these surveillance jets flew over the area, taking pictures, and we had the keyhole satellite satellites, as you were mentioning, taking pictures of the area. You know, not to interrupt, but I, I did some uh, some uh, homework in a sense on the keyhole uh, satellites and exactly what they were being used for at that particular time. More importantly, the uh, the chain of command of exactly who would actually give a particular order or uh, or grant access to surveillances such as that, that went all the way back to you'd have to get the order from the military, had to get the order from Langley, from yeah. the CIA in Virginia to get access to these. So the fact that they were in, that they were being used for surveilling this particular area means that Langley. The CIA knew that this was going on as well. Right. Now that's interesting because the the report, of, uh, the main report upon which all this information is based on, which came from a group within the military intelligence, the report states that the the U.S. recovery of of the crashed object was a CIA operation, and so given what yeah. you just said, then that that adds more. Uh, impact yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, so we have Here, the. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, no, wait a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll like yeah, I was just going to say that. Uh, so we have these Mexican soldiers start to um, basically die. And the trucks kind of roll to a standstill in the desert. Uh, they uh, several of the soldiers attempt to get out of their vehicles and. Then they just basically they just fall over and die in the sand, and uh, overflights the U.S. overflights and the military satellites, intelligence satellites are pecking up 
this activity of these trucks coming to a stop, standstill in the desert, soldiers getting out and falling. You got all these bodies lying outside their vehicles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so at that point, the team that had already been assembling uh, in in Texas at a secret military installation near the Texas-New Mexico border then gets a green light to go ahead and proceed. Uh, we think that now here's the critical point, and that is that and we had we had to talk to a number of people who have investigated crash retrievals in the past to really understand that uh, why the U.S. would go in on a mission like this. Uh, it probably had to do with uh, with the concern that this was all occurring within say 30 miles of the Texas border. Right. So within 30 miles, you had some kind of contamination going on. Sure. And we had a potential outbreak of something that could possibly be very difficult to contain. It had already the caused... The version, the, yeah. Uh, Mexico's version of the Andromeda strain. Huh. It had basically caused the death of, we estimate, 24 Mexican soldiers by this point. And it it was spreading. It was out there. It was in the environment. Right. And so this might have been, we think, the primary factor for the dispatch of a quick retrieval operation into Mexico, just 30 miles in from the Texas border, just a quick going in there, Stop grabbing the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But with a lot more preparation uh, and a lot better equipment and resources uh, that were brought to bear, um, we've been told that these teams are on a constant ready. They have all the equipment ready to go. They have vehicles ready to go at a moment's notice. And that's they're ready to scramble at a moment's notice. They never know where they're going to be dispatched to. Right. So this is a reality. So they uh, they dispatched their recovery team from the United States into Mexico, and then and again thirty miles. I mean that's that's nothing. That's easy. They, they, it's easy for them to get in and out. Um, they recovered this thing, and then where did it go from there? Yeah, let's talk about the recovery a little bit. We okay. had helicopters out of Fort Bliss. According to the Denob report again, there were three Huey helicopters, Vietnam uh, era Huey fighter helicopters, uh, armed, and uh, and then one cargo, one big old cargo uh, helicopter called a, a Sea Stallion. Um, the helicopters were unmarked, and. Uh, there was no identifying characteristics to the uniforms worn by the personnel. Mm-hmm. Um, so the helicopters departed at approximately 2.38 p.m. on August 26th, and they made the short flight down along the Rio Grande River, remaining on the Texas side the whole time. There was no need to... Uh, enter into Mexican airspace until the last possible moment. Right. So the decision was made to stay right along on the north side of the demarcation of the international boundary, which is the Rio Grande River, all the way down near uh, near the town of Presidio, Texas. Was that the uh, uh, Candelaria, uh, Noe? Yeah, just Candelaria, which is a tiny little one traffic light town just north of Presidio. Mm-hmm. So they were almost to Presidio, and then they cut in, uh, across the border quickly, rapid res- uh, a, a rapid incursion, arriving at the uh, site of where the Mexican convoy had stopped at approximately 4.53 p.m., and uh, 21 minutes elapsed at the site. In other words, they were there at the site only 21 minutes. So and that's that, amazing when you stop and think about it. Yeah, I mean, that's land, get loaded, and yeah. move it. Land there, dispose of what you need to dispose of, attach, 
the uh, crashed disc to the uh, big cargo helicopter, move the cargo helicopter out, gather all the remaining wreckage together, and exploded in an apparent disinfecting process or an attempt to disperse or destroy whatever agents caused the death of the Mexican recovery team. At the, at, they blew them all up. And, and, and at, at, at the point... And I'll make make this clear because it's going to be it's going to be very important later on that when they did this recovery, they were not recovering from the actual crash site. They were recovering where the convoy had stopped, and so they actually recovered from the convoy. Correct. Correct. The convoy had traveled quite a distance. We estimate from where the initial crash occurred, and so you know they had come down a ways before the sol- the Mexican soldiers started feeling sick right. from whatever they, they were exposed to. Now, you're talking about feeling a little under the weather tonight, Jack. Can you imagine these guys, these yeah. poor guys? Yeah. A lot of them are, you know, probably don't have a high school education. They've, they're A lot of them are from the southern part of Mexico to join the military. They're, they come from impoverished backgrounds. They don't have a, a lot of formal education. They don't really, they don't receive much training before they're posted out to uh, whatever area of Mexico they, they're needed at. Mm-hmm. And so you have these poor guys. They have no idea what's happening to them. They just suddenly, they're not feeling so hot. Right. And then they start dropping like flies out in the middle of the desert. Huh. And so, you know, that that yeah. would definitely be a drag. You no, know, I was just wondering if um, you, you want to, just share, or remember when we were with Mr. Venegas, and we were out there, and we went out there toward uh, the El Llano, right, the, uh, the the flat area, but there we could, we could, he pointed out where there is the mountain peaks, and that's where Candelaria is at. I, I, to me, I just didn't realize how close that was uh, to, to us, uh, where, we, where we were at on the Mexican yeah, side. The interesting thing about it, that that's real good, uh, Ruben, and I had kind of put that in the back of my mind, but we were standing at the place where we think the initial crash between the UFO and the small plane occurred, which is this large, flat plane Mm -hmm. that's known there as El Llano. Uh, El Llano is a Mexican phrase meaning the plane, uh, P-L-A-I-N. It's a flat area between mountain ranges, basically. And the mountain range that's just to the to the uh, north of this El Llano area is the actual mountain range that goes right along the Rio Grande River. So just over those mountains, there's, you've got the Rio Grande River, and then there's Texas right there. Right. So we were standing in the middle of El Llano, looking at this mountain range, and just beyond that mountain range is Texas. And Pedro Venegas, uh, the gentleman who says that in 1974 he heard a series of explosions that rattled uh, his little ranch house there in El Llano, he was telling us these incredible stories about things he has seen in the night sky since then. And he pointed out to us the peaks of the mountain range on the Mexican side, and beyond that we could see the peaks of some hazy bluish mountains in the distance. And he said, now those are the Chinate Mountains. Okay. Well, the Chinate Mountains are the are very famous in, in Texas folklore because they are at Marfa, Texas. And the Chinates are the site where the so-called Marfa lights have been appearing. These are mm-hmm. mysterious, glowing, luminous orbs yes, of light yes. that have been appearing in, in that area of Texas since the 1800s. Right, right. And there's been a lot of reported UFO activity, and people have even said there might be underground bases here and stuff like this going on for many, many years, even before there were aircraft flying sure. in the sky. Yeah. You know, there was that whole wave of uh, Texas, the great Texas airship sightings of the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, and uh, one of which reportedly cl- crashed near Dallas. Uh-huh. Uh, and became uh, a famous, very early UFO crash retrieval um, in the northern part of the state. But anyway, so he was pointing out to us how close we were from that point, how close we were to, to, to the Texas border, to the Chinati Mountains, 
and he said, you can take a four-wheel drive and just go over this ra this range, this mountain range that we're looking at right here along the Rio Grande River, and he said, and just when you get to the other side of those mountains is the small town of Candelaria, Texas. Mm -hmm. You can just go right across the river, in uh, and you're there at Candelaria. So uh, we felt pretty confident that given the details that are provided in the Denev report, that we were standing right there where the Denev report said that this had occurred. We we had a fairly high level of confidence at that point. Right. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I. I don't know if we had a chance to really elaborate about what is the Denif report, but I'm sure your list, the listeners out there are wondering, what the heck, yeah. how did we get all this information? Right. You know, how do we know the time frames and the time schedules? And it goes back again earlier in the discussion that this was a military report within. Right. And, uh, and, but, we found some more research late uh, after toward the end of when we get into after the uh, the the uh, description of uh, what the sequence is what we found out more about Deneb, uh the origin of Deneb. that's a whole other that's a very fascinating uh part of the research that we just have been getting into and this is new stuff isn't it new stuff that uh that you found Oh, yeah, this is new. I mean, you know, it's amazing that uh, Noah had put together some historical information, and then, um, and it's very, very uh, the the origin of the word Deneb it, itself. It's uh, very, very uh, interesting. But oh. we'll, we'll we'll continue with the with the time frame first, and then we'll this would be something to add to this. I think you're you're you're, you're going to be quite surprised. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. All right, so. So again, they they retrieve this, and I'm going to kind of try and speed up the uh, the timeline just a little bit so we can dive into some of the new stuff because I think it'll be uh, important, especially for those that uh, actually tune in after the program to the History Channel's uh, UFO Hunters. But they they re they recovered this this object from the uh, the military convoy. They found that the military convoy had deceased from uh, unknown reasons, whether it be biological or chemical. And where did they, where they sent this, they, they dispatched this thing to Atlanta? Well, yeah, uh, well, yeah. you know, uh, I, I, I needed to say that, uh, jump into this uh, real quickly because this is where um, Noe's, um, his, uh, his knowledge of this area and, you know, when he first connected to with me, um, originally about uh, about the History Channel because this was aired on the about Mexico's Roswell back in uh, 2005 right. and uh, one of the things that was quite remarkable was the fact that you know, as Noe had mentioned Candelaria and uh, some of the other towns that were mentioned in the Denim Report and Noe is really familiar with the geography there and that's what made, made the story sound a lot more credible and, Yeah, the thing uh, about the thing about it is that these are not places that even appear in, on most road maps right. of Texas. It is, the person who put this information together had an intimate and very detailed knowledge of the geography of southwest and west Texas and north northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. I mean, they knew, you know, I talked about, for example, this one traffic light town, Candelaria, it's got, until recently, it had only a single dirt road that connected it to the rest of the state. I mean, there was no paved road coming into it. Um, they've got, they talk about, uh, there's such a level of detail in this original, in this report that we're talking about that, that first came out in the, um, in the early 90s, uh, when it first started circulating. Um, there was such a level of detail in it that when I first read it, it seemed to me very clear that the people who put it together uh, obviously knew their stuff. I mean, there was there's absolutely nothing in it that we've been able to find that makes you kind of like some other documents and so forth that about UFOs that have come out over the years that you kind of read, and some of it sounds really far-fetched. Yeah. And their facts don't seem to be entirely straight. Right. There was nothing about this that raised those sorts of alarms with us. That 
geography seem right, the trajectory of the aircraft involved, the speeds and distances that would be covered at those speeds, the type of aircraft that were said to be used, the procedures that were carried out by both the Mexicans and the uh, U.S. recovery team. Everything seemed to be according to what we know to be the case. All right. Well, with that, let's let's just hit on this for, for a second, just so people know. Where did this report come from? Okay, in the in the early 90s, well, actually, let's back up to uh, Leonard Stringfield, uh, a pioneering UFO researcher who uh, he worked with J. Allen Hynek and many other early UFO researchers in the 50s and 60s and on into the 70s. Uh, well, um, Leonard Stringfield became interested. He kind of special was one of the first to specialize in the area of what are known as crash retrievals, uh -huh. where an object has actually crashed and there has been usually a military retrieval of the object where it is spirited away and never seen again. Right. Those sorts of stories were something that Leonard Stringfield specialized in beginning in the 60s and carrying on through to the 70s and the 80s. Um, Stringfield unfortunately passed away in the in the early 90s, wasn't it, Ruben? Uh, yes, yeah. the same. So anyway, but he left this volume of information, and Ruben and I ran across some material that he had read where he said that as early as the early 1980s, he had heard the late 1970s or early 1980s. He says, "quote." I heard of the Chihuahua case before, either in the late 1970s or early 1980s. The only detail I vaguely recall is that a U.S. military team had covertly crossed into Mexico to retrieve the object. Okay. So, apparently this was known to a select few UFO, uh, UFO researchers, possibly as early as the late 1970s and early 1980s. Now, when, as the uh, Internet started to develop, and before the Internet we had something known as the BBSs, or Bulletin Board, Board Services. Services. Sure. And a lot of people would dial up using modems, uh, usually 1,200 baud or 2,400 <laughs> baud modems, oh, yeah. and at, at a snail's pace you would connect to these electronic Bulletin Board Services, and it was all text only. Right. There was no clicking of a mouse. In fact, you did usually didn't use mice right. or, or mouse at that time. <laughs> so, and, and you would correspond or post messages for other people. Well, anyway, in the early 1990s, uh, BBS services were hitting really big in the United States. People were sharing a lot of information about UFO sightings. And suddenly... Somebody posted this report, which later came to be known as the Denim Report. And the reason it's called the Denim Report is because it is in the form of a memo, and it is the memo is says subject Chihuahua UFO. Uh, U, uh, I'm sorry, Chihuahua disc crash. The memo is carries a. Uh, it was directed to all Deneb team members. Uh -huh. Deneb team members. Now, one of the first UFO researchers to receive a copy of this report was Elaine Douglas, who received it anonymously in the mail uh, with a return address, not a return address, but a postmark out of uh, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, she examined the report. She thought there was merit in it. She wished she could follow it up. But she was at the time in Washington, D.C., involved in uh, UFO activity. Uh, research up there, mm -hmm. and so she wasn't in a position to physically to do investigating of something that happened in northern Mexico. So uh, she, but she kind of filed it away in her memory banks as something that sounded highly credible, and uh, she noted that to her there seemed little doubt that this has come. This report had come from somewhere within uh, the U.S. military intelligence. Circles, and it was possibly from someone who had recently left or had retired, and uh, had cobbled together this information based on things that they had seen as a result of their their job or their 
clearance level within the intelligence community. So we had this report that surfaced in the 90s, and it was once the once the internet became uh, you know available to more people in the mid 90s, and uh, it became to circulate. It began circulating even more widely. And oh. Chief uh, Elaine Douglas, who wrote a chapter for our book, one of the chapters that is included in our book, Mexico's Roswell, was written and contributed by Elaine. Uh, she has gone into exactly what it is about the report that it makes her believe strongly that it was, uh, you know, written by someone within with a, with a vast knowledge of military intelligence. Well, I got to say, um, leaking if, if if that's the the uh, the method that they used, leaking it through the BBS systems back in the day like that. It's really a brilliant move because on the BBS systems, I mean, unless someone was really paying attention to what they were looking at, it would have just filtered on through. I mean, it would be a brilliant way to leak something because those of the out there that came across it that uh, kind of it would it would stand out to a select few. The others, it would they would just pass right by it and be like, whatever. Exactly. But now yeah. we're getting now we're getting to the point where we're gonna. We're going to blow your mind about Deneb. Deneb is a very significant term, both in astronomy as well as in speculative fiction, or some people call it science fiction. Uh Deneb is not just a random word that was chosen, we don't think. It has a lot of significance. Uh, If you look at it from a scientific perspective, Deneb, which is also known as Alpha Cygnus, is a very bright blue star in the constellation Cygnus, mm-hmm. and it is, in fact, uh, as we, we looked this up in a number of astronomy books and websites, it is one of the largest, brightest objects in the night sky, and um, for example, astronomy.com says this about Den- uh, Deneb, it says, Deneb is a super giant star that pumps out enough light to equal 60,000 suns. So in other words, it has a light output in the night sky, one of the brightest objects, a light output equal to 60,000 suns. And it is approximately 1,600 light years away from Earth. And Deneb, now this is ironic, Deneb is often mistaken by ground observers for a UFO. Huh. And many in, in, you know how in the 1950s and 60s there was the... um, Project Blue Book, and there were attempts to explain away a lot of UFO sightings as being misidentification of astronomical objects in the night sky. Well, Deneb is used as an excuse by Air Force Blue Book investigators a lot of times to explain something that somebody had seen that they thought was a UFO. And so these guys from Blue Book, would, in their report, would conclude that what the observer had seen was actually the bright star Deneb. Uh-huh. Now, Deneb also appears in a lot of science fiction. Uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, for example, had a, a number of short stories that were set in Alpha Cygnus and on the, uh, you know, in that constellation. And also, Deneb is mentioned for all the trek trekkies out there in your audience. Now, Deneb is mentioned in several episodes of the original Star Trek series, including Where No Man Has Gone Before and The Trouble with Tribbles, which were two of the most popular episodes. (laughs) Right. But now, the really significant part about this is... Wait, wait, hold on. Hold that thought right there. Okay. Stay right there, because this is fascinating. Yeah, uh, we're getting to the juicy part. We've only just begun with Deneb. It it reaches into high significance from here. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, because like what you said in the beginning... The report said to all members of Denim, right? Denim team members. Denim team right. members. All right, hang right there. We're going to be uh, saying good night to all those out there in Seattle. Um, if you want to, uh, we still have an hour left of this program. So uh, for those of you out there in Seattle that want to continue listening, you can do so by going to WPRTRadio.com. And uh, otherwise, for all you folks out in Seattle, we will see you next Wednesday night. At uh, KRWM 106.9 FM HD3, Contact Talk Radio, 
This is Cap- 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 Canada. This is Captain Jack. This is Paranormal Radio, and uh, I will be right back. August 26th, 1974, 8 a.m. Nine hours after a civilian plane disappeared over the desert, a Mexican recovery team hunts for the downed craft. Across the border, American intelligence is listening in. At 10.35 a.m., the Americans intercept the Mexican military radio report. The wreckage of the missing plane has been spotted just outside Coyame. p.m. Unsure of what's happened, U.S. officials greenlight their rescue team. Four helicopters with team members aboard depart Fort Bliss. One of the things that seems obvious in this case is that the the government, the U.S. government, responded very expertly, very quickly and very organized. They had this team that assembled in Fort Bliss and in no time were down there on site recovering this. They've done this before. But nothing will prepare the Americans for what they are about to find. Dressed in bioprotection suits, the American soldiers approach the silent convoy and find all the Mexicans dead. There is no time to investigate what killed the Mexican team, but ufologists have their theories. They somehow came in contact with a, uh, a lethal agent, a bacteriological agent that was um, from out of this world or an extraterrestrial biological agent of some sort that killed them, uh, which is my favorite theory. The U.S. recovery team quickly tends to business. It finds the 16-foot-wide silver UFO strapped to the back of a flatbed truck. The straps are reconfigured and connected to a cargo cable from the Sea Stallion helicopter. Safely secured, the estimated 1,500-pound disc is lifted up and headed back to the U.S. With the saucer gone, the team immediately turns their attention to the remaining evidence. The plane wreckage, vehicles from the convoy, and the Mexican team bodies are gathered. They gathered the debris, the bodies from the Mexican recovery team, and then they exploded them with high explosives. The reason why is to hide the evidence. Their work done, the recovery team heads back to base. Where the UFO was taken is unknown. Some have speculated Atlanta, Fort Bliss, or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It is an unprecedented event, and I think it's comparable to what happened in Roswell, New Mexico. If this 1974 UFO crash was real, there was no evidence to prove it. Only the passing down of the story from generation to generation kept the tale alive. Interesting stuff. Hey, Jimmy's uh, playing the different uh, audios that he sent over. He just played uh, number three of that. And uh, just so uh, everyone, just, uh, if they're just tuning in or anything, kind of get caught up to speed really quickly. Very, very interesting stuff. But we're talking about the Denim Report. And uh, continue on with uh, the history behind this. Yeah, so, uh, then, uh, can, can I jump ahead, in here real quick? Weird, uh, no, yes, go right ahead. Because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, things happen sometimes by accident uh, when you're doing research. And uh, I was always in the, under the impression that Denim had like an acronym to it. Uh-huh. And I was, was trying to figure what does the word "adenib" mean, and uh, and it wasn't until uh, one evening I was helping a friend of mine uh, working with on his telescope, and uh, we were programming it. So you know nowadays you have telescopes that have these small computer um, uh, guidance systems. And so as we were programming it, I accidentally hit uh, a button, and the thing just started moving by itself. And then it aimed at a certain part of the sky, and then when I looked down, it said Deneb. Huh. And it's D-E-N-E-B. I said, oh, my God. I said, oh, this is what, I said, Deneb, why, why a star? 
So uh, immediately, uh, uh, I, I looked it. I looked it up on the internet and bingo. And then uh, when I uh, shared this information with Noe, and Noe had already done more research, and it's just coming out to be a whole fascinating piece of work that uh, uh, that's been accumulated here. So. No, go ahead. Please continue because it, it just gets more fascinating. With yeah, so you know we've got this super bright star, uh, Dena, in the constellation Cygnus, and it's long been a source of uh, it has stirred up the imagination of, of science fiction writers, and it has uh, it's been an object that's been uh, widely studied and photographed by astronomers over the years. Uh, one of the most imposing. Uh, presences in the night sky. So, um, but even more significant is its, its role in history, because Deneb has been observed since, obviously, since it's one of the brightest points of sources of light in the night sky. It's been observed by ancient astronomers for many hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, so we we ran across a, some really interesting research that's been done into how the ancients looked at Deneb and the constellation Cygnus. And it turns out that uh, Cygnus and Deneb were both very important to the ancient people of not just Mexico, but also South America and other, and other places on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it, it, here's one reference we found. It says that the, the brightest star of the Cygnus constellation, Deneb, uh, which was uh, it was kind of revered by the by the ancients. It was the pole star seventeen thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it was aligned as the pole star for Earth. Uh, but there's something even more intriguing aspect to this is that Cygnus lies at a critical juncture in the Milky Way galaxy, which is known as the Great Rift. So that's an astronomical term, the Great Rift. It's a spot. Uh, where the Milky Way splits into two long sides with a dark, murky area dividing it. Okay. And this was, this precise location of the Milky Way has served as a key component in many ancient religious belief systems. The most mysterious and important religious beliefs held by many ancient people concern the origin and destiny of souls, and they seem to have closely associated the destiny of human beings here on this earth with the great rift area of the Milky Way galaxy, they viewed that as, for some reason, they viewed it as a specific geographic location central to the uh, destiny of the human soul. Huh. And uh, it's interesting that this occurs in the religions of southern Mexico, um, the significance that, that was attributed and, and in the Mayan religion, the Mayan culture, the uh, Great Rift plays a large part in, in their be religious belief systems. Now, another interesting thing, in recent years, uh, there have been a number of folks, UFO researchers, that have um, brought out the perspective that Cygnus they say that Cygnus is the place where two of the five species of alien entities that visit the Earth frequently uh, originate from. In other words, there are five species, the way they view it, five species of alien entities that visit the Earth, and two of them are said to originate from Cygnus. Uh, if, there's a fascinating website called serpo.org, um, and it talks about these five species, the, um, and, and uh, three of the species are said to originate in Zeta Reticuli, uh -huh. uh, but, but the two others, uh, the Archaloids and the uh, Heploloids, are said to originate in Cygnus. So this is, you know, these are all uh, kind of peripheral, uh, it, kind of trivial points in, in some respects, but at the same time it brings to light how significant the, the significance of the use of the word Deneb, right. which we don't we don't think was just casually tossed in there. We think that there was a purpose and it has 
you know this these all these meanings it's a, it's a meaning rich it would, it word. would suggest to me that they use that particular name as a, a means of identification of the recovered object i mean am i am i'm on the right right track with this in this thinking if if it is true that some of the uh, entities that have been visiting the earth are from the from the uh, from the Cygnus and Deneb area, you know, from the Deneb star system in Cygnus, then th this stands to reason that that could very well be the case. That's definitely true. Yeah, you, you've had uh, Stanton, uh, you have had Stanton Friedman on uh, several occasions, right, yes. right Captain? Yes, and he's always always mentioned Zeti Ridiculi uh -huh. in his research, and then of course uh, Marjorie Fish and finding the uh, the star map of Betty Bar Barney Hill. Right. And the point is that I uh, reticulate. So, uh, I mean, as Noah is saying, if we keep going with this, I mean, the, the possibility that Denim has some other um, meaning to behind that. Right. So, yeah. And just just to touch on that, there's an interesting point that you brought up too. Um, a lot of, I mean, one of the most intriguing things about that particular case is the star map and the relevance to that star map. And whenever Betty had drawn it, uh, she had drawn it with three extra stars on there. And at the particular time, we, if you looked at that star, at that particular constellation, say, okay, she's got it off because she's drawn three more. But then, later in history, we, dis we discover that those three stars are actually there, and she was right to begin with. So the, the significance of the star map with this and the significance of the particular star that you're speaking of when related to this is very, very intriguing because of it, it kind of seems to me that it's a form of, of saying, okay, this is classified under this. This is the particular category. The dead of area. Now, here's, here's the mind-blowing part of this, uh, Jack, and I, I've saved the best for last. We were talking about the Mayans. Uh -huh. The Mayan culture in southern Mexico they attributed a lot of significance to this great rift, which is where Deneb is located in, near in the Milky Way galaxy. And it was, in fact, at the center of their cosmology and their religious beliefs. Uh -huh. They believed that all of life sprang forward from the great rift or the Deneb region of the constellation Cygnus. They viewed it as the very center of the galaxy. And uh, one of the references we, we found was, it was the following. It says, these processes and concepts are intimately involved in the understanding that the Milky Way is the great mother and the dark rift is the, the birthplace, the area where birth is given. Right. It is a place of transformation that the prospective male king must enter in order to re be reborn as king, a divine being. And because of those beliefs, Mayan astronomers were really fixated on Cygnus. Now, here's the other deal. On December 21st of 2012, which is coming up here in, in a few years, December 21st, 2012, a rare astronomical alignment will occur where the winter solstice sun will appear right in the middle of the Great Rift. Uh. Now, now, the year 2012 is significant to a lot of people. <coughs> And one of the researchers that has done a lot with this says that at dawn on the winter solstice of A.D. 2012, the sun will be right in the dark rift, and the orientation is such that the Milky Way rims the horizon at all points around. Thus, the Milky Way sits on the earth, touching it at all points around, opening up the cosmic sky portal. The galactic and solar planes are thus aligned. And this is all part of these ancient Mayan prophecies that point out that the year 2012 is the end of the Mayan great cycle. Right. And some people have interpreted it to possibly mean that this could mean the end of human civilization as we know it. Right. So 2012 right. becomes a, an incredibly significant term when you look at ancient prophecies. A lot of them coincide right at the year 2012 as being the the year that something extremely important in the entire human history is is going to happen. 
had either of you had a chance to read that story that we had up on the website um, about the age of the dragon? The I didn't have the a dragon. That's that. the. Um, oh, I just thought, I just remember that. <clears throat> it, um, go go ahead. Th- th- there was a gentleman that uh, was in a, uh, and this is I don't want to get too far off the subject, but it's kind of interesting that you bring all that up. Uh, a gentleman had sent me an, an email saying that uh, he would have been in a very uh, serious car accident, which very serious is an understatement. But he was in a coma for a, for a few days, and um, just before he woke up from the coma, he uh, he had this what I keep saying is a vi- describing as a vision, but the way he explained it to me, it wasn't a vision. It was just as real as as you and I sitting down and having coffee. But this man hands him a golden coin that bore the, a symbol of a dragon on it with like a, a seven in the middle of it. And the man explains to him that the age of the dragon is about to hatch from its fiery egg and was going to consume everything on, on the planet and allow the planet to be reborn. And that, uh, that he should find someone to, to pass on this information and so on and so forth. So he sent this over to me. I posted the picture that he had, he had uh, put together about it. Um, up on the website, it was up there. One of our listeners uh, just happened to come across. I think they were looking at spaceweather.com or something. Right, something the, like solar, that. the solar flares. Yeah, there's like that large magnetic knot on the sun. Yeah. Well, I'll be damned if that knot isn't. It's the dragon. It, it, right. It, it's an outline of the dragon, and it, they it, say it's going to peak. Uh, late 2000, late 2011, early 2012, which would be in exactly. our know, solar cycle. I, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's interesting. I, I just saw a whole thing. In fact, on the History Channel last night, it was on dealing with the sun, uh-huh. and they brought up that point. Now, when he mentioned uh, the dragon, I remember that's what the, uh, the, the there was a reference to that. I can't. Be, I'm trying to remember if that's what the Chinese. Uh, astronomers were uh, were viewing back then when we were having these. Solar flares impacting the Earth, yeah. uh, impacting the weather, and that, and the fact that, that we're getting now into 2012, and as Noe was mentioning, of course, uh, the Mayan prophecy, and then now, now you're seeing the, the, the research and the word Deneb, how significance becoming even more than just an acronym, possibly. <laughs> right, right. It's very interesting. So, connecting the dots here, Jack, what we have is this this stunning report. Uh, but apparently people had a high level of knowledge of this incident that occurred in 1974. Mm-hmm. They sat on it, as in the Roswell, New Mexico incident right. that occurred in the 40s. It was a long period of time before information finally started coming out about it. In fact, it was almost the same period of time from 1947 when the Roswell, New Mexico crash occurred until... Jesse Marcel Sr. began talking to Stan Friedman in 1970, uh, 1978. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was uh, uh, 79, actually. And then the first book on the Roswell incident was published in 1980. Right. Uh, I mean, that's a long period of time, from 47 to 1980. Well, this uh, incident occurred in 1974, and uh, it really didn't surface until about 1992 in the Denim report, which started circulating around the BBS systems, as we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Ruin and I published our uh, first book ever on this case in 1997. So, once again, we've got roughly the same period of time. Um, one of our big motivations, uh, you know, people have read our book and we've received a lot of compliments on it oh, yeah. but but it's clear that the book does not resolve come anywhere near to resolving what really happened at Koyama right. in 1974 it's just a beginning stage exactly. we were very we were very much motivated to put this out and one of the people that really um, encouraged us to put it out there even though we didn't have all the bits and pieces of information that we would have liked to have had was then Doctor, uh, not Doctor, but uh, Stan Friedman, who is a uh, nuclear physicist and longtime UFO researcher, very interested in, in the outcome of this case. He's been on your show several times, yeah. uh, and uh, he felt that perhaps having this book out there and this discussion about 1974 Koyama 
may encourage some folks who might have been involved in this incident to come forward with more information, which is exactly what happened following the 1980 publication of the Roswell incident, by uh, which Stan Friedman was a part of, right. uh, that was published in '80. So that's what we were hoping, and that was our objective. How has has uh, new stuff started to surface since since the book? Well, we started uh, to make some connections. Ruben can talk more about this. Yeah, uh, uh, one of the things um, was um, we have been working with um, our our Mexican researchers uh, in various parts of Mexico, and they formalized a group called OMIFO, which is uh, basically uh, the uh, civilian national UFO organization. They're uh, uh, uniting under uh, under a, a under a similar group that we have here, like MUFON. Uh-huh which uh, both Noe and I are members of, and I'm uh, the state director for Northern California MUFON, um, we um, have been finding out that as they're doing the research, one of uh, the, the president of OMIFO is going to be actually going to request more uh, of what their version of Freedom of Information uh, Act, where they're going to be asked the Mexican government to release further their files. Oh, and if that's the case, and then when we'll, we, we may start finding out more of the relationship between <clears throat> what's been going on with the U.S. military, the CIA part, as well as uh, its, its uh, uh, involvement in, the, in, in Mexico and, and other parts of the world in terms of uh, crash retrievals, but primarily Mexico. Right. Um, the other factor, of course, uh, and we had mentioned this earlier, and we had talked about acid <clears throat> crashing. Uh, of course, we uh, in our book we really talked about the uh, missiles that were launched uh, mistakenly into um, in, in, in crash into Mexico and were retrie- retrieved by U.S. teams, and how little by little the um, the, uh, the other part of this is Operation um, um, Blue Fly in, um, in in Moon Dust, where it is the operation where American um, uh, teams will go into an area. Now, you know, I, I don't want to stray away from the main topic, but what's interesting here, Captain, is here we have a scenario of a U.S. spy satellite. Uh, what if they don't shoot it down, and what if it does crash in an area? Uh, I mean, they're ready to go after it. Right. Which, and so, which by the way, uh, a little earlier, about uh, 10, 12 tonight, um, got a report in that the U.S. Navy missile successfully okay. hit the dead spy satellite above the Pacific, which, you know, it struck me kind of interesting, uh, kind of odd, you know, that everything was kind of timed on, you know, we got the uh, the lunar eclipse and we've got the shuttle coming down and we've got all this stuff and then, and then to decide to shoot it out of the sky, it's just interesting, I don't know, just kind of struck me, struck me odd, the timing of, of everything of it, so... There's something really odd about this entire Mexico's Roswell case. There's there's a high level of, um, Ruben has explained it as synchronicity. We keep running into people who have little bits of information and everything seems to tie together. And then a bunch of different events just happen to fall into place. We run across a lead here and a lead there. So slowly this is coming around. Uh-huh. I was thinking we could pick up the timeline back again and kind of finalize the uh, what happened during those three days that this was an ongoing and active case there, Jack. Sure. We had we had taken it to where the uh, U.S. soldiers had arrived at the scene of the crash. Right. Uh, there were 21 minutes elapsed from the time that the U.S. helicopters touched the surface there in the Chihuahuan Desert north of Koyama to the time that they had strapped the UFO uh, on a tow line and the big cargo hel- helicopter took off uh, from from the Chihuahuan Desert headed back into Texas at 5.14 p.m. on August 26, 1974. So 21 minutes it took for the UFO to be towed away from the area. Uh, it was possibly encased in... Uh, some kind of uh, protective skin, such as had been developed for use in the NASA space program at that time, um, to prevent any uh, spread of contaminants. It was very likely uh, covered in some kind of protective um, cargo uh, ra- wrapping or uh, protective skin. Right. 
the uh, hel- the Huey, the personnel in the Huey helicopters in the three Hueys, Hueys stayed behind after the cargo helicopter lifted it off. Uh, they stayed behind for an additional 32 minutes to clean up the site and to prevent uh, what they considered, I'm sure, some kind of potentially lethal contamination resulting from the remaining debris. So that's when they exploded all the remaining uh, wreckage and evidence there. And they they departed the scene at 5.46 p.m., so 32 minutes later. So the entire operation on the ground took a total of uh, just about an hour. So actually uh, 53 minutes, if I'm totaling that up correctly. From the time the first helicopter touched down until the last helicopter departed. That was quick. 53 minutes. So 5.46, the Hueys were airborne, and at 7 p.m. they landed in a remote area of West Texas known as the Davis Mountain. That's an interesting part of the state. Uh, it is where uh, one of the largest um, telescope or, or astronomical facilities in the United States is the uh, McDonald Observatory, which is operated by the University of Texas right. system. Uh, because this area is so remote and, and not very subject to artificial lighting in the area, there's the sparsely populated and very dark skies at a very high elevation. Uh, this observatory has been in existence, I believe, since the 1920s. Uh, because the uh, viewing conditions are ideal there for observing the night sky. So it was in this dark, mountainous area where the team uh, landed for an overnight stay. Well, not overnight. Uh, they left. They just apparently just landed there to kind of uh, either await further orders or just to uh, give the team a break after the recovery effort. And at 2.25 a.m. the following morning, which was approximately uh, seven or eight hours later, the uh, helicopters flew on ahead again, and they they met up with a truck convoy near Van Horn, Texas. And then from there, there was a transfer of uh, of the disk from the UFO, uh, from the uh, of the UFO, from the uh, helico- cargo helicopter onto a truck that was part of this convoy. Mm-hmm. This was all done in the, in the secrecy and, the, and shrouded by the by the nighttime in this very uh, remote area of West Texas. So um, after that, in the Denim report, we have a kind of a rather cryptic statement that the UFO. Uh, was taken to Atlanta, Georgia. We feel, because of the connection with the Center for Disease Control, which was the leading facility at that time for handling uh, contamination, uh, biological contamination, that there may have been a fear that there were some microorganisms still remaining in the wreckage. And then, from then on, the Denim Report says that the UFO may have been taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or another Air Force base. Right. So uh, that that is basically that concludes the uh, this roughly three day span of this crash and retrieval, um, and then that was uh, August 1974, and then in 1993, Elaine Douglas received this anonymous document in the mail. Uh, she was working in Washington, D.C. for a UFO advo- advocacy group called Operation Right to Know. And that same document was mailed to a number of other UFO researchers around the United States and in Europe, including Lennon Stringfield, whom we've already talked about. Right. And, and that's when Elaine uh, did research into it. And uh, the document itself is dated March 23, 1992. That's the date on the Deneb report. Uh, so that's it's kind of, it's kind of how curious, it came isn't it? That it would be dated 1992. I mean, what do you, why would that be? 
Well, my theory is that that see, in 1992 was the peak of the BBS era in the United States. Right. So someone posted it in the, this memo format to a BBS for uh, that had, and in those times, uh, I was a big part of the whole BBS thing. Oh, that yeah, was me too. that was the infancy of what we now know as uh, the forums and chat rooms and so forth of the internet. That was the beginning stages of all that. Uh, kind of group uh, sharing of information and data. So anyway, the way it worked back then is there were the there were public BBSs which anyone could dial into, right. and then there were private BBSs. Right. Now, one of the big complaints that the sysops or system operators who ran these BBSs back in those days, the the guys who ran the private BBSs did not like stuff taken off of their BBSs and posted onto public BBSs. That was like the ultimate no-no that would get you kicked off their private BBS. Right. So it's very likely, it's very possible that this document first surfaced in a closed or private BBS uh, system of the early 90s. And so that would explain the date, 1992. That's a perfect match for when BBSs were really going strong, right. and then somebody might have cross-posted this document to a public BBS, and once it was there, it, it was picked up by just yeah. anybody. Yeah. You know, it was no, no longer no, private. I, there, there's another point I, I wanted also just to bring across on that, uh, that landmark 1990-1992 is the fact that Operation Right to Know, as Noe had stated with Lane Douglas, uh, they were putting pressure on the uh, on, on the government to open their files back then, uh -huh. and yeah. so there were protests going on in in actually um, in front of the White House right around that period. So it stands to reason that as people as the media was focusing on these uh, demonstrations, that it started to catch the attention of certain people, and that might have been part of the connection uh, right. again. Why this person? gone to Elaine Douglas and several others, but Elaine's background, uh, she graduated from MIT uh, with her background was in military affairs, huh. but she had very good knowledge of how military and governmental uh, programs work. So yeah, with what Noe's mentioning about the whole, that particular <clears throat> Internet electronic board and then the fact that there was a movement already starting or been, been initiated during that time goes hand in hand. Sure, sure. And the other interesting part is that someone who was in the military, in a in a in a high level of the military in the 1970s, in the early to mid 1970s, would be probably reaching military retirement age, right around 1990, early 90s, which was certainly the case in the revelations that started coming out about the Roswell, New Mexico mm -hmm. incident. Is we started getting people who are, were leaving the military in the 1970s, you know, about 20, 30 years later. So the same thing with this, you had 1974 to, to let's say, just for rounding off 1994, so that's a 20-year span. People who were high up in the military and in an intelligence community in the, in the 1974 time period would probably be nearing retirement or retiring around the early 1990s. Now, that's another possible explanation. Yeah, you know, it really does seem that uh, whenever it comes to this type of information, the people that come forward with some of the most, uh, most credible and most uh, intriguing information are those that are inside the military or had some sort of hands-on experience with uh, with UFOs, whether it be in documentation or whatever. And uh, once they're free from the military is when they kind of, and I'm sure that there's more information that they may know, but they leak out uh, enough to let, you know, the rest of us kind of follow the breadcrumbs in a sense and put all the pieces together. But one of the points that Clifford Stone has made to us, he, he's the gentleman who's been involved in crash retrieval operations himself and was privy to a lot of top secret information. Uh, one of the points that he drove home to us is that uh, 
Actually, the number of people who have access to the actual physical evidence in our country is extremely small. Uh -huh. We're talking like a handful of people. Right. Very closely guarded, ultra, beyond ultra top secret. I mean, way it pales in comparison to military secrets and things sure, like that. Sure. So, so it isn't a, as large of a group as you would think. Now, below that core group of people who have access to physical evidence, you've got people who see reports and things cross their desk. Right. And there, you know, the situation is that you're in a position where you you will not put yourself in a situation where you could be caught taking anything from the from your work area right so th uh, information that you would leave you would basically carry in your head uh -huh. you know and you would write it down later right and uh, any any disclosure or dissemination of that information would occur on a on a highly anonymous basis sure. uh, because you would not want definitely your name associated with that so well, let's uh, let's just kind of outline this a little bit and just kind of get your thoughts and everything. Now, you're a part of the uh, the Discovery Channel's uh, UFO hunters investigating this case. How did you feel that the investigation of this particular case went? I mean, you guys were were you directly a part of it? Were you uh, kind of consultants on the outside? I mean, how does that work? Well, we were basically, uh, both Noe and I were basically advisors to that particular production okay. um, where we actually went out to the crash site and we uh, interviewed the witnesses that were there that we had met previously uh, that was included in our, in our book and where they mentioned their experiences of the UFO sightings. And also uh, going back um, to there was another area, which is uh, when we first went out there, uh, we were shown an area where there was a pit, and uh, this pit basically had a number of um, items, uh, 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 vehicle parts, and a number of other things, and it was really mysterious that, that, that it was there. And um, what they did was they basically started doing some, some lab work, some lab tests. Right. And so uh, although, although in the History Channel there was two other, uh, two other stories that I was also part of where there were two... Uh, objects that had crashed. One was actually a a, a, a um, space debris. Mm -hmm. It's made in the U.S., so that's all that case. And the other that may have been, who knows, uh, possibly a, a plasma or or ball lightnings. But going back to our, our case here, um, we, we one one thing that uh, both Noe and I, you know, all, this research is basically it, just, it comes out of our own pocket. You know, we're not getting any funding from any outside source. Right. And the uh, History Channel offered us uh, the opportunity for us to also go back and uh, to continue our research. And, and so basically, uh, I mean, they pay for our expenses, and at the same time we provided our, 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 in, our background, our information of what we had to, to reconstruct what had happened. Right. But, but again, it, it, it's still, I mean, the case is not solved. Uh, we, there's still a lot more research that has to, go, that has to be done. Um, you know, we never said that was actually the plane crash that we found, even though we found the fragments of it, of a plane. But at the same time, it's just that uh, we know it takes a lot more hard work and it's going to take more further expeditions. But uh, maybe Noe no, would like to elaborate on that point as well. Well, when, when we were first approached uh, by the History Channel, the initial contact was they wanted us to just go back to Koyama and kind of do the same things we had previously done in investigating this case, and they were going to kind of just follow along with us, and and they were going to film uh, the witnesses that we had previously talked to, and we, they were going to go out to the locations we had previously been to mm -hmm. and just film. So in other words, we were kind of going through the same motions that we had already done in in uh, researching our book and in putting our book out. And that's what was really neat about it because it gave us, as Ruben said, it gave us an opportunity to go back uh, without having to expend any of our own funding because they were pa paying our expenses. So it enabled us to go back and talk to some of the same people again and take take our questions a little bit beyond what we did the first time. And then we also got to tap into the resources that they had for their program 
as as the folks who are going to watch this show tonight are going to find out that there was a lot of laboratory analysis that the History Channel did with the fragments that were brought back from uh, from Koyama during our trip, and I, I'm not going to spoil the fun for everybody, but <laughs> I've already seen the show because here in the Central Time Zone, the program has just finished finished a while ago, right. and there were, but there were some interesting revelations about the composition of the jellified aluminum um, that we found at the site of the small airplane crash. What they were trying to determine was whether there could have been a transference. If this was, in fact, the uh, fragments from the small airplane that crashed with the UFO, could there have been a transference of some of the UFO material or skin onto the fragments from the small plane? So they do this careful, in-depth analysis in the lab in tonight's UFO Hunter show. Right which uh, yield, yielded some very interesting conclusions there at the end of the program. So needless to say, <laughs> because of the fact that this, uh, all the information about this is um, slowly coming out, uh, am I safe to say that uh, this is just the beginning for both of you of exploring this, uh, this case more and coming out with more information that you find out? Not only this case, but uh, what, you know, as amazing as this may sound to some folks, uh, there have been a number of other UFO crash and retrieval cases along the Texas-Mexico border over the years. Mm-hmm. So not only are we expecting to elaborate and expound upon this case, but we are looking into three or four other seemingly legitimate historic uh, crash retrievals that have occurred in Mexico in, in uh, Texas-Mexico border area, including the one that is the topic of our next book, and it's based on the testimony of a living um, witness who is uh, Colonel Willing, uh, Robert Willingham, uh, who lives in the Wichita Falls area of Texas, who was an, an uh, U.S. Air Force pilot in the 50s who actually chased the UFO, saw it crashed, uh, saw it crash and then went and, and got a small plane and flew down to the crash site and he walked in the midst of this debris field that littered about a quarter of a mile uh, radius area there along the, the border and he picked up a piece of this wreckage uh, which was he later analyzed and found it to be unlike any any metal that's known to earth science so it's an intriguing and amazing story it's documented he's a he's a you know fantastic witness and and still despite the fact that he's 82 years old he still has a vivid recall uh, of this incident which had been previously documented in statements he had made as early as the 1960s we got so. a, we, had, we had a chance last time you were on to play some of those audios from uh from him describing some of that stuff is fascinating. Right, and and that's just an example of how this has led us to other similar cases that have happened here in the Southwest that seem to somehow be related. There's this tie-in, once again, there's this mysterious tie-in to uh, northern Mexico and and Mexican uh, kind of mysticism and uh, the prophecies of the Mayans, the coming of the year 2012, uh-huh. the, re- the so-called prophecies is about the return of the ancient ones, right. uh, these uh, people from the stars that are supposed to return at a certain point in time, and that will herald the end of the age. And uh, all of this, you know, this increased acceptance on the part of, of uh, the Mexican people uh, of UFO sightings and similar paranormal events revolving around the the turn of the new century all of this somehow and we haven't quite figured it all out and it you know it, it may be beyond our capacity to do so but it certainly makes for an interesting study yeah well i gotta hand it to you after reading the book and uh just you know exploring this uh this case with you uh, a few times i gotta say you guys have done a, a fantastic job as far as research on this and uh my head is definitely off to you on it 
Oh, thank, well, thank you, you, Captain, and you know, appreciate uh, the opportunity that you've allowed us to to really go in depth uh, of the uh, of this particular case and having it on previously. And you know, it's not very often that we get that opportunity. And there's so much, as Noe has had indicated, uh, as, we're, we're, as we go go into this, I'm you, you know, uh, there's going to be some other gems that that, that will be coming out oh, yeah. uh, as we're continuing the research. And and actually, I. I believe no. I think uh, uh, the the whole that whole Deneb uh, research uh, that we uncovered. I mean, that's the first time we've ever mentioned that on the air to anybody. And in, in your uh, that's your, correct. The first on your show. What? Yeah, that was something that we. Yeah, that that's actually the first time we've ever brought up the whole background of the Deneb. Uh, we prepared a. We've recently been requested to prepare an article for a, a national magazine. Uh-huh. And, uh, which hopefully will be out in print soon. And it was in preparing this article that we developed a lot of the information that we revealed for the first time ever on your show tonight. Very nice. Very nice. Definitely fascinating stuff. I mean, whenever you said you were going to blow my mind, you definitely did that. I mean, that's just, uh, extremely intriguing to me, all those different connections and stuff. Because I think that's one of the things that I enjoyed uh, about, you know, exploring topics like this is some of the, you know, connecting some of the dots, you know, whether it be from one case to the next, there's definitely a, a connective pattern to all of it, you know, wh- whatever it may be, and on, on all different types of facets. And it's just, it's just incredibly intriguing to me. Yep, that, okay, I'd just like to read this real quickly about one of the prophecy of the Six Sun by the Mayan uh, uh, focus here. Uh, but it says here, the Mayan references to visitors from other worlds are, are found in the six sun prophecies that which was written back in 755 AD and one prophecy states in the era of the six sun all that was buried will be discovered hmm. truth shall be the seed of life and the sons of the six sun will be the ones who travel through the stars hmm. so they'll be back interesting hmm. Well then, alrighty, you two. Well, what I, I've I've already set up the uh, the program to uh, record, so uh, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to be watching the uh, the episode on History Channel. So, <laughs> yeah, I would appreciate your feedback too, there, Captain. What your thoughts were? Yeah, definitely. Most based, definitely. Based, based on you reading the book and and interviewing us over the last several times that you that you've had us, it'd be interesting to get your perspective. Yeah, I will. I'll shoot you an email tomorrow and uh whenever I whenever I come out of my uh my medication induced induced coma. <laughs> so, I, I I mean I I, I understand because this back uh that, that went out on, on me I've been uh I just had hardly no energy for the last week so I'm just really uh grateful that I know he's been able to carry on the ball and <laughs> and for the last three hours and we want to let everybody know uh, that uh, the Koyama incident uh, is actually about 27 minutes into tonight's UFO Hunters program. Okay. The first 26 minutes or so of the program deal with other uh, cases that have occurred in Mexico more recently of flaming yeah, objects that have fallen out of the sky and so forth. And then that all of that is kind of like a prelude to uh, this big case, which starts at about the 27-minute marker and then continues for the rest of the show. At, at about the 27-minute mark, they go into the history of the Koyama case, the crash between the UFO and the plane, and then it shows Ruben and myself and the folks from the UFO Hunters team out in the middle of the desert finding the wreckage from the plane, and then uh, the last part is a caref- the careful laboratory analysis of what we found out on, in the desert, which was especially fascinating to me because I, of course, Ruben and I had not seen that, uh, what the results of their laboratory analyses were. And so that was kind of a stunning revelation tonight. Uh, well, I tell you, I've been looking forward to this particular episode for a long time since I first had you guys on. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank Very you, good. there, Captain. <laughs> so, all right, you two.